Hi, my name is Laura Cavaroli, and I am a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto with expertise in the conduct of systematic reviews and meta-analyses, as well as the conduct of clinical trials. Throughout a series of videos, I will present information on systematic reviews and meta-analyses with a specific focus on SRMAs of clinical trials. The overall goal of these videos are to review what a systematic review and meta-analysis is and show you how, when they are well conducted, they can be used to help address research questions with a specific focus on the context of nutrition and health. I'm going to turn off my video now so that we can focus on the slides and the information within. My only disclosure is that I am currently a MITAX Elevate postdoctoral fellow jointly funded by the Government of Canada and the Canadian Sugar Institute. So these are some learning objectives that I've set out for this series of webinars, which are key skills to help you in your own research. By the end of the webinars, I hope you'll have a better understanding of what SRMAs are, including what their purpose is. You will understand how to read SRMAs and how to assess whether or not it may be useful to help you answer your research question. And lastly, by understanding the steps in how SRMAs are performed, we'll understand the aspects which make a well-conducted SRMA and will make you well-equipped to critically assess one you read. I will present a few examples within the webinars to help highlight some aspects. And then in the final set of webinars, we will fully walk through an example so you can see how you can critically assess a SRMA in practice. So regardless of macronutrient, there is debate about what is the best type of food to eat and which nutrients or foods are the causes of our major chronic health conditions. For example, what is causing the diabetes and obesity pandemics of the 21st century? These media reports and popular fad diets typically result from drawing conclusions out of some scientific article or opinion piece, which in itself may be questionable in quality and in the conclusions drawn. These result in confusion around how to consolidate the information from different studies many of which are presenting opposing or incongruent results while also being aware that there is a need to address the quality of these studies. The importance in finding ways to consolidate information extends to helping our health professionals in making evidence-based decisions on what their patients should be told. Even highly cited trials may be challenged or refuted over time. So clinical decision making requires ongoing reconciliation of studies that provide different answers to the same question. So how do we best interpret what the true effects may be? What is required is a suitable means to collate all the available information. An ideal review is one that is comprehensive and unbiased. The basic types of reviews available are the narrative review and the systematic review. It is important to understand the differences between these two types of reviews. A narrative review discusses and summarizes the literature on a particular topic and is usually a comprehensive overview done by a content expert as opposed to addressing a specific question. They also do not often report on how the literature search was conducted or how it was decided which studies were to be included. A systematic review, however, has a clearly formulated question and uses systemic and explicit methods to identify and select studies and has a set of predetermined criteria by which they identify which studies will be included in the review. So if we compare the two types of reviews, some of the concerns of a narrative review are that it promotes specific views of a topic which results in bias, it is irreproducible, and may contrast only a few selected studies which may be unrepresentative of the total evidence and be misleading. On the other hand, a systematic review comprehensively identifies all studies for a specific focused question, is structured and reproducible, minimizes bias, explores the methods and variability between studies, and lastly, it allows the reader to gauge for themselves the quality of the review process. Our next important technique to understand is what is a meta-analysis? A meta-analysis is a statistical technique for combining the findings from several independent studies to resolve discrepancies and provide a quantitative estimate of the treatment effect. It gives a larger sample size than any individual study 
allowing for greater precision of estimates, as well as identifying sources of diversity. So the three main strengths of a meta-analysis are that it, one, improves precision, two, it helps to answer a question not posed by individual studies, and three, it can help settle controversies and generate new hypotheses when exploring the variation in results. So here's a question. Are all meta-analyses systematic reviews? And the answer here is no. And this is an important thing to understand. A systematic review and meta-analysis are actually two separate things. Generally, one is the identification of studies and one is a statistical technique. To understand better the importance of combining these two techniques when performing meta-analyses, let's look at a quick example. So generally, you can conduct a meta-analysis and derive a quantitative pooled estimate for any set of studies you choose. To demonstrate this, let's say Dr. Black found 10 studies in which nutrient A raised tissue levels of vitamin X. If we did a meta-analysis of these 10 studies, we would conclude that A raises levels of vitamin X. On the other hand, let's say Dr. White finds a different set of 10 studies which show the opposite, that is that nutrient A lowers levels of vitamin X in tissue. If we did a meta-analysis of these 10 studies, we would find that nutrient A lowers tissue levels of vitamin X. Now we are left thinking, who is correct, Dr. Black or Dr. White? Does A raise or lower tissue levels of vitamin X? So now let's consult a third doctor, Dr. Gray, who conducted a systematic review and found all 20 studies and then conducted a meta-analysis. What he would find is that there is no treatment effect. This example demonstrates that you can conduct a meta-analysis and derive a quantitative summary effect estimate from any set of studies you choose, and it highlights the importance of how your conclusions can change depending on how you selected the studies you want to include. Thus, it is important to combine a meta-analysis with a well-conducted systematic review, that is one that has an explicit and structured search and selection strategy for identifying the studies you will include. A SRMA is also considered an original piece of research because it is a new set of data resulting from an originally conceived analysis plan. This contrasts the narrative review or expert opinion we discussed earlier, which is not new data, but simply a summary. This is reflected in the hierarchy of evidence and evidence-based medicine as presented here. Clinicians are increasingly using SRMAs to keep up to date and clinical guidelines use SRMAs to assess available data and draw conclusions. Systematic reviews and meta-analyses have the potential to provide the best evidence for efficacy, safety, and or effectiveness in nutritional sciences research. That is, when limitations and heterogeneity are appropriately acknowledged and handled. This figure demonstrates the purpose and usefulness of well-conducted SRMAs. In pooling together all the evidence on a particular topic, they can help to address debates and provide evidence for clinical practice guidelines and policies and can identify knowledge gaps to inform future trial design. So I hope that through what I've reviewed, you now understand the purpose of SRMAs and the importance of combining a meta-analysis with a systematic review. In the next webinar, I will review the general steps in conducting a SRMA analysis. This information will be really important for you to be able to critically assess a SRMA you are reading, so stay tuned. I'd like to acknowledge my mentors and lab group as many of these slides have been developed and shared by members of our team.